All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Obed Figueroa I'm from Deep Diversity Pre-Medical, uh, coming to you again with this episode. Uh, we have the honor and privilege to be with uh, another practicing physician, uh, Dr. Rodrigo Castro. Um, he is an osteopathic physician, um, DO, board certified in family medicine and specializes in integrative medicine and interventional pain management. So we'll learn a lot more about that. Uh, he earned uh, his BA from Duke University and completed his master's in human biology at Long Island University CW Post. He then went on to earn his medical degree uh, with honors from Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in New York City. His family medicine training was at Overlook Medical Center in Summit, New Jersey, a clinical affiliate of Icon School, School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's currently the director of non-operative care at Pinnacle Orthopedics in Buffalo, New York. Um, he has extensive knowledge in treating a variety of musculoskeletal disorders. Um, he is also originally from New York City and is an avid runner in his free time. So welcome, welcome doctor. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. So if I may um, just explain um, our intentions. Um, so uh, in LinkedIn, um, I have over 1300 pre-med students. Um, some of them are already physicians. Um, but still hanging around and listening and learning. And so what we've been doing is, um, particularly because of COVID, uh, is going a bit above to share information. Um, and so now we're doing it through video uh, so that this, the pre-med students can listen and learn. So my intention is not to dive in too much, you know, with a discussion of curriculum, but more so your walk. Um, you know, is there anyone that can relate to some of the experiences that you had um, and maybe there's some lessons that you can share uh, that they can benefit from. So I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Uh, before we begin, um, I'd just like to start with something a little fun to get to know you, uh, the audience to get to know you a little more. Uh, so if you can give me your first responses when I ask these questions, just, you know, speed questions, okay? Sure. Okay, so your favorite book? Oh, The Alchemist. Oh, interesting. Your favorite drink? Favorite drink? Oh. Alcohol drink. Yeah. If, you drink, if you drink alcohol. Yeah, no, I, I do drink alcohol. It kind of uh, changes it up every once in a while. I think it's a seasonal thing. Mm -hmm. right I've been drinking uh, a little bit of red wine here and there. But in the summer, I, I was drinking uh, some sour beers, and they, they were quite good. Mm, uh, they don't really taste like beer. They taste more like a, like a mixed drink. So <laughs> that, was, that was good. I'll have to try that. Yeah. Uh, your favorite color? Uh, blue. Your favorite music genre? Oh, that's a toughie. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I'd probably say electronic music, um, but that, that, that kind of involves and, and kind of uh, incorporates a lot of different genres, but uh, I listen to quite a bit of music. Um, favorite sport? Basketball. Favorite uh, movie? Favorite movie? Oh. oh, that's a tough, that's a tough one. I don't really watch too many movies these days. Yeah. Um, um, I'm gonna have to go with an oldie, I guess. Uh, I'll go with Star Wars. That's that, you know, that brings me back to childhood. <laughs> All right. Um, so, favorite restaurant? Um, let's see. As far as uh, back in New York City, because I, I I miss it quite a bit. I can mm -hmm. tell you, Pio Pio is one of my favorites. Pio Pio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 that that I miss quite a bit. I, I think about it often. <laughs> Got your mouth watering. Yeah. Um, so what about your favorite food or dessert that you just feel guilty after you eat it? Because you just, you dive in. Uh, salt and vinegar chips. Because mm. the, bag's, the bag's done when, uh, when, when, I, when I'm thinking about it, when I'm able to think about it. <laughs> um, favorite vacation spot? Oh, that's going to be Hawaii for sure. Oof, I'd imagine. Um, so PC or Mac? Uh, Mac. All right, Android or iPhone? iPhone. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Um, okay so let's dive in. Uh, and so I shared my intentions with you. And if we could start with when you were in high school, you know, how you were thinking and did you be, were you thinking of the sciences back then? I can say that I definitely was thinking of the sciences. I mean, that, that's kind of where I was leaning towards my, my, my whole education. Um, and then I, I, as far as, you know, the choice of undergrad, I, I wasn't, I, I guess I, I did take that into consideration and obviously going to Duke or 
you know, that, that certainly was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but once I got there, uh, things changed up a little bit and I realized that I, I could study anything I wanted at that time and I had the flexibility to do that, which certainly in high school, you, you, you don't really, or at least I didn't get that, that opportunity. It's kind of your follow, you know, whatever, pretty much whatever was your schedule, you, you, you did. Um, you kind of had that balance, but uh, and then so that's how I ended up uh, majoring in psychology in undergrad and and really kind of leaned in, in that direction. Was there anyone in your family that influenced you to to go on this path? Um, I think my mom worked at uh, in labor and delivery back in Chile. She was she was a nurse in, in Chile, and I think that she certainly probably has the big biggest influence on me growing up and 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 to this day, realistically. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay, so you then make it to Duke. And would you say, I'm, I'm curious if you had any challenges while you were with your undergrad um, that you would want to share and how, how'd you work through it? Sure, uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest challenge, I say the, the most obvious one was kind of being away from home, obviously being from New York City and never having left New York City for my, my entire life. It was a big, big culture shock to move to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I don't think I was prepared for that as a 17 year old. Um, and then to be out on my own. Um, so, so that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, and uh, I think, you know, friends, friends that I made there were able to kind of make it a little bit easier. Most of the, the close friends that I have from undergraduate are from the New York City area. And so I kind of leaned in that direction and kind of found comfort through that and, and eventually made my way home after graduating. So while you were there, um, were there any particular subjects where you, you know, you, was, you struggled and you had to get extra help? Sure, yeah, I, there definitely was. I mean, uh, I think organic chemistry was something that I'm sure you, you've heard that everyone struggles with quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and I ended up digging, uh, doing some summer classes actually in organic chemistry. Actually, when I was back in New York, I, I took uh, organic chemistry at, at Columbia and I actually found it to be a lot uh, easier, I guess it is uh, at least maybe just more, um, more relatable in that in that setting for whatever reason and maybe a smaller group and and a little bit more uh, attention um, made it a little bit easier for me so I, I was able to do that and and um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know be able to succeed in that way nice yeah the, um, so then you're an undergrad and that that MCAT exam is approaching mm -hmm. right and so how did you prepare for that well, so yeah, so there was a little bit of a gap there after undergrad for the MCAT. I, I, to be quite honest with you, with psychology and then, uh, you know, going through again, undergraduate, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was um, unsure about where I wanted to go, how I wanted to live my life, where I thought my career was headed. I appreciate that honesty. Yeah, and so there was a, there was a, a little gap there a few years back where where I actually, after undergrad, went into the family business and helped, uh, helped my family out, which is retail hardware and plumbing. It's still there on the Upper West Side. My wow. sister actually runs the store now. <laughs> so that's pretty cool to see a, a female <laughs> running her own, uh, her own business there. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then I took night classes um, while I was working at Hunter College to finish up the, the, the pre-med uh, requ requirements. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then ultimately took the MCATs a few years after, where I think uh, I had a little bit more maturity, a little more discipline for studying, gotcha. and, uh, and, and I was able to, to do fairly well. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because I am curious on, you know, how you got yourself prepared. You know, when you mentioned, um, you know, your study skills getting stronger, how did yeah. you acquire that? Like, where did you find that information or, or people to help you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of it just comes from practice and, and, and discipline and, and repetition of really being able to kind of get into it and be able to sit down and, and, and sit at a desk for hours on end. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you, you take courses. I, I, I did take a test takers course, I think it's called at some point to, to be able to do that. But again, those are more test taking strategies. But as far as the, the, the sitting down and actually being able to to be disciplined to sit down. That, that's something that you kind of just have to do through repetition. So I'm also curious, because um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not hearing from you that you have your, your friends were, were all going into medicine, you know, back in undergrad or family members. And so I wonder if you experienced this like detachment and, 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 and embattlement, you know, going in a direction where few are going. Um, did you feel that? Did you experience that? I don't think I consciously felt it. Um, certainly, I did experience that. I mean, everyone th that I know, no, I didn't have any friends who were going into medicine or were in the field. 
Um, so yeah, no, that was a, a different experience for me. And so I think that's where I kind of just relied on, on my own self-motivation and, and discipline to be able to, to, to move forward in that path. And it, and it took me longer than the average person, mm -hmm. right? I mean, obviously there, there were, uh, you know, I started medical school, I think I was 28 years old uh, when I started medical school. So uh, I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I think that's good insight. Did you, um, so amongst your peers, I mean, were there, did you get some of the, ah, oh, come on guy, this is, that's too hard, that's too long, or, you know, do you really want to do that? Did you, and, and how did you like, you know, just stay focused and kept, kept going? Yeah, I, you know, it, it did. I mean, I, look, I managed to have fun along the way for sure. It's not about, you know, certainly that, that, that you know, I, in my 20s were, were I, I had fun in New York City and lived, lived a, a great life. So I, I was able to experience quite a bit and be able to see a lot of things and, and, and do a lot of things ultimately. And so, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I think everyone in my life was supportive, understood that it was a difficult journey, um, but uh, for the most part, we're supportive. Yeah. Awesome. So you take the MCAT, um, and did you take it more than once? I did. I took it twice. Okay. Where where did you find challenges when you within your first experience? Um, uh, I think it was it was a fluky thing to be quite honest with you. But uh, I I can't use that as an excuse. There were um there were like there was like fire alarms going off in the middle of the test. Um, there, there was uh, we had to evacuate uh, for a few minutes. Um, so it was a little bit of a bizarre experience. But I think that even you know, having the, that pressure situation of, of taking the, uh, such a big exam, it had been a few years for me to, to be in that position. Mm -hmm. So I think that second time around, you're a little, much more comfortable in that setting. And, and so I think it, it is helpful for you. Obviously, if you can prepare yourself by, by taking more practice tests and being in a very kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a structured environment in mm. taking that test that, that certainly i think that would be beneficial if you can somehow manage that but uh yeah i think certainly the second time around you're much more comfortable you kind of know what to expect now you so you're moving forward and you are applying to medical schools um did you apply to more than one i did yes yeah and who's advising you i mean you're just doing this and, and... great great question so I, at i tried to take advantage of the resources when i was at hunter college um, there, the, the guidance department and the, the pre-professional department there. And I think that they were actually very helpful um, at that time. And, and I had never really reached out and sought that advice. I kind of like to do things on my own and thought, okay, I mean, uh, everyone, it seems like everyone has to do it on their own. Hunter was really the first time where I, where I was able to realize, wow, there are people who are willing to help you and, and are, are, are there to help you. That's kind of, that's their job. I, I hadn't experienced that before. I never really sought that out at Duke beforehand. Um, and so when I was at Hunter, uh, I looked into that and, and I think I applied to medical school uh, at that time, right when I finished up my prerequisites, uh, mm -hmm. was not accepted. And, uh, and then went on to get the master's to, to be able to beef up the, the, uh, the resume. Okay, got you, got you. And at, at Hunter, was, was Woodhill the person? Mm, I, I, I can't remember the name. No, I don't remember the name. I think it was Woodhill. Um, okay. All right. So then you went and got the master's mm -hmm. and, and how did that help you? So only... I, I, yeah. I, as far as being familiar, the, the, the curriculum for that master's program, I, I could say was very similar to the curriculum uh, of the first two years of medical school. Um, and so uh, I think certainly that, that opened my eyes to, to the depth of knowledge that, that needed to be studied for, for medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think obviously having another degree in, in whatever aspect of life you choose, is, is it obviously, you know, pads a resume, makes you look that much more impressive as a candidate and, and does hopefully fulfills you as a person and, and allows you to, to move forward and, and take those next steps. So you then um, begin a doctorate program. Uh, and I'm curious, as you're going into it, you know, how did that feel to you? Um, were you prepared mentally, emotionally? Um, yeah, share what you think. I think I think at that time, again, being an older student, I think being 28, I think I was prepared. I, I think at that point I, I had gotten whatever silliness out and, and was focused on, on moving forward and and and, uh, and kind of wanting to be successful. Uh, you know, and a lot of cliches probably in, in some of these interviews that you have of it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, when I had my master's program, I actually was in a, a severe car accident. Hmm. Um, and I was in the in the ICU for about five days, and ultimately, um, I think that made me realize that I needed to take advantage of of, of life and and move forward with things, stop procrastinating, and really kind of 
have that focus to, to move towards what I want and, and take the steps to, to achieve it. Got you. You know, the, the value of information that you guys have in that curriculum for the doctorate in medicine is, is a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious, um, you know, how, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, you're absolutely right. It's certainly a, a whole lot of information. And I think you just got to take it chunk by chunk. You separate it and kind of then, it's tough. When, when it all comes together, I can't say that it came together by second year, by taking the steps at that time. No, you're still answering questions. I, I, I'm still, kind of, you know, receiving information, processing it, and just regurgitating answers. Mm-hmm. I think it was actually once I got into my clinical rotations where that information really started to make sense. And the practical aspect of, of practicing medicine um, really solidified that information. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And were you in medical school, um, were you working within a group or you were kind of still, you know, solo? Yeah, I mean, I, I worked in a group. I, obviously, I think, you know, Toro uh, did a good job of, of, of creating groups and, and, and having people work in groups and, and assist each other. But I think I mostly focused on my own. I, I would come in rather early. Um, I would be in the building, I think, by 6 a.m. And, and, and really uh, kind of my most valuable hours were at, at those times. Mm-hmm. from six to, to eight or nine or whatever, whatever it was uh, on a daily basis to be able to study. And uh, I, I really, that, that's when I was mo- my most productive. And to this day, I'm still most productive early in the morning. <laughs> was there any, um, for your academics in the doctorate program, was there any professor that really was, had a profound influence on you? Um, as far as in, in the, 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 um, the first two years of the, the basic uh, curriculum, mm-hmm. I can't say that anyone really sticks out as far as being able to, but certainly, I, I forget some of the names, I'm sorry, Ovid, but uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the osteopathic physicians, the, the ones who actually had us do our, um, our manipulative uh, uh, training, mm-hmm. um, those were, certainly had the most impact on me. Uh, you know, I know Dr. Peters by name, I, I, obviously he was a, a friendly face and always someone who could be valued to, to, to ask questions. Probably Dr. Uh, Morris. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Morris as well. Yes, yes. Dr. Morris was certainly it was certainly a, a, a positive influence for sure. He was a good man. Wow. Yeah. I know he's retired, but what a good man. Yes, he was. And so, um, could you share with a what a day in the life looks like for you um, in, in under your specialty, so that uh, one considering this uh, can conceptualize it? Sure. I guess I'll just backtrack for a second a little bit and 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 say that. I chose family medicine because I, I think it opened doors to, to practicing whatever it is that you want to do. And, and you can make family medicine whatever it is that you want. And so I was practicing urgent care in New Jersey, and we decided to move up to Buffalo. And I, I well, I, I, I'll take that back. I, we, I interviewed for the job in Buffalo, mm-hmm. like the job, and then we moved to Buffalo. Yes. Um, my wife is from Toronto, so that was closer to home. So she was on board with that move. <laughs> um, so before that, I was at working at urgent care and doing 12-hour shifts, so running around like a chicken without a head, um, just kind of seeing patients every two or three minutes or so and really kind of uh, pumping through volume. But then, uh, uh, I, then I joined an orthopedic spine uh, practice, mm-hmm. and uh, realistically, and obviously not being a surgeon, I, I did assist. I was the first assistant in, in surgeries, um, but I was... Um, practicing more pain management, kind of managing those patients who aren't surgical candidates and uh, being able to offer them treatment modalities to, to help with their pain, whether it's a neck, mid or lower back. And so as far as kind of the, the typical day, it started at 8 a.m. And patients usually about 15 minute appointments um, and, and being able to, to see them and, and, and assist and however I can. I will say a lot of my work is, is paperwork to some degree. Mm. Um, um, because I, I do a lot of uh, motor vehicle accident work and a lot of workers' compensation work as well. So that, that makes up a majority of, of my day. Um, but then, so that mixes in some of the fun, to be quite honest with you. Um, I do telephone depositions and expert uh, testimony on, on the phone. And sometimes you got to get a little more aggressive with lawyers on the phone. And, and that, that can be fun, too. <laughs> <laughs> Will you um, so approach, I heard, oh, wow, interviewing a few people, and they have said, the business aspect of medicine, they were not prepared for and had to quickly learn that. Mm. Um, was that a shock to you as well? I don't think so. Again, I think that for me, 
I'm very practical. I think coming from a retail customer service environment from my family business, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I was kind of influenced by, you know, the day I was born, really. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I kind of knew that that medicine is is a, a, a service oriented business. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is a business. And so I, my eyes were wide open to that kind of going into it. Great. Um, so with Latino background, I'm wondering, you know, um, how has that helped you um, in particular with patient engagement? Um, you know, I've done research on this and I'm familiar, right, mm -hmm. as well, um, walking a particular walk. Just I'm curious for you, is there any distinctives, you know, do you find patients gravitate more to you if you speak from the mother tongue? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I am fluent in Spanish and, and, and love to speak in Spanish with my patients, whether it's in Buffalo or, or, or in Toronto. I, I, I do have quite a bit of my, my patients uh, are Spanish speaking. And certainly those encounters, I think they're much uh, more appreciative of, of the treatment that they get. And, and just honestly being able to speak with, with uh, someone in the mother tongue, as you said. Um, I, I think that takes me back to one of my first rotations at, at, at Toro. Um, when I was at uh, Bronx, Lebanon, and I think I wrote about it in my essay for uh, residency. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of the first patients that I had seen in one of my first rotations. And, uh, and he said to me, uh, tu eres mi papá, <laughs> which, you know, is, I'm your father. And I look at him like, uh, I'm sorry. And it took me a second. And basically, you know, it's him telling me, look, I, I trust you. You speak my language. You understand me. I'm in your hands. <laughs> and, and thank you for helping me. I mean, mm -hmm. so... You know, that experience stayed with me and stays with me to this day. And I appreciate that and, and accept the responsibility. And, and I'm so uh, happy to, to help those who, who, you know, otherwise may not get the same level of care because there's um, uh, some communication difficulties. Mm. So you're a married man as well. So how many years? Yes, sir. Uh, eight years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. How has that changed your oh, work? Oh, I lied. I'm sorry. Nine years. Excuse me. <laughs> You're getting in trouble. Um, but how has that changed your world, you know? Um, well, it's, it's, it's great to have a life partner. Um, mm -hmm. You feel extra support. You know, I, I, you mentioned that I kind of, I'd been, uh, you know, really focused and kind of solo motivated until medical school. Mm -hmm. I met her during medical school. Um, she did not go to Toro. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, I, and uh, it, it was wonderful to have a partner who's aligned with you and, and you're able to, to work on, on a path to, to move forward in life together. And she's in the same profession or not? Yeah, she is a doctor. She's a doctor. She uh, practices uh, family medicine and aesthetic medicine. Wow, what a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Things in common. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have two children you mentioned? Two little girls. Yeah, Mia and Vera. One, Mia's um, seven, going to be eight very soon, and Vera's four. <laughs> oh boy, too great. Yeah, they, they keep me busy for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you so much. You, you shared a lot. And I know there's going to be quite a few people that can relate to your walk. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share? I don't think so. But I mean, I, I, I hope I was able to give uh, some insight and, and, and the students there who are looking in, into a career in medicine. I think that, uh, you know, not everyone's path is, is straight. Um, you know, mine had a lot of twists and turns in it, but, uh, you know, I, I think as long as you understand you're going in that general direction, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, anything is possible and you'll be able to, to be successful. Now, if I, you know, there is one thing. Um, yeah, please. When you're, in terms of allopathic or osteopathic, when you, if you could think back what your thoughts were then, and then you made your choice, mm -hmm. um, can you share what, what was going on with you then? Well, actually, yeah, to be quite honest with you, I was on my way to going to the, the Caribbean. I was going to go to Ross or St. George's before uh, Toro called mm -hmm. um, and, and said, look, we've got a spot. And uh, I was ecstatic to be able to stay home in New York. Mm -hmm. So New York City was a, a huge draw, obviously, but I had not had much exposure to osteopathic medicine previously. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as far as kind of the the thought process of, of being a uh, holistic and, and more patient centered care. Um, that is something that resonated with me significantly. I, I, I um, there is one course in undergrad that I took, which was called the art of healing at Duke. And it was a student run course mm -hmm. um, where we would go out and actually go to, we went to do yoga studio, Tai Chi, um, acupuncture, massage and, and, and physical therapy, and really took a look at, at, at these modalities and, and, and how helpful they can be for, for folks.
Mm-hmm. Um, that was uh, that was inspiring to me and kind of, uh, I think, also led me in my general direction for sure. So that was something that was a part of me. Maybe I wasn't uh, as uh, educated on, on knowing exactly what uh, osteopathic medicine was, but once I did, I'm so glad uh, that, I, that I made the decision. And how has the COVID experience been for you? Mm. So it, it's been it's been quite interesting. Um, it transitioned initially. It transitioned my entire practice virtually, um, but a lot of what I do is interventional pain medicine, which basically involves needles. And so I cannot virtually um, inject anyone with with any medication. <laughs> so so it involves me me going into into the office. And and I will say, um, practicing in both Toronto and Buffalo, I get to see the different uh, attitudes of patients um, here in Canada. And in Toronto specifically, um, folks are a little bit more cautious uh, about going out and even going to the doctors. It is difficult to get patients to come into the office. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Buffalo, it almost feels like it's uh, you know business as usual there. Okay. Folks are taking precautions, but you know everyone is doing what they're doing. So um, it actually, I, I changed my positions in Buffalo during COVID, and I think partially due to COVID, um, but joined a larger practice in Buffalo, and I'm, I'm happy and glad that I did. Awesome. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Castro. Wow. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, and I say thanks to your family as well for allowing us to have some time with you Sure. in your contribution. Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ovid. I appreciate it. And again, I hope that uh, uh, those that are listening and watching are able to take uh, even one bit of information from me and, and be able to use it going forward. So yeah. thank you very much. It does help. All right, guys. So this is going to end this episode and we will see you next week with another practicing physician making a difference. All right, talk to you soon.